Well, that's not good for your ears. No. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so you were born in, in Germany uh, in a refugee camp. Was it after World War II? I don't remember. <laughs> uh, yeah. What do you mean, was it after World War II? How old do you fucking think I am? <laughs> There's a, I was, uh, yeah, I was born after, after World War II. Um, yeah, my parents were Polish Jews who, were, uh, who had managed to uh, escape the Holocaust, uh, or at least escape it. They were hidden for two and a half years. Um, about uh, oh, how many years ago now? Almost 20 years ago, I went back to Poland with them. I uh, made a documentary, which is um, a reunion between my parents and the Polish farmers that hid them for two and a half years. It's called So Many Miracles, if anybody's interested in it. It's uh, the, uh, National Center for, the National Center for Jewish Film at Brandeis University handles uh, the distribution of the DVD of that. I also wrote a book of the same title, which is based on interviews that I did with my parents somewhere between the late 70s and the late 80s, uh, middle to late 80s, that uh, was published by Penguin. That's also possible. Somewhere, somewhere it's out of print, but probably could find it. But I was born um, in outside of uh, Munich in what was um, slave labor munitions camp. It was barracks uh, for slave laborers in a place called Wolfshausen, Fahrenwald. And uh, it was the American zone, which everybody who was trying to get away from the communists and the Russians were trying desperately to get into the American zone of Germany and away from Poland and away from the Eastern Bloc as the world was divided up between the Brits, the Americans, and the Russians. And, uh, and my parents managed to get there. My father was, had been an actor right before the war in Yiddish theater. and. Uh, I grew up with this idea. I mean, we emigrated to Montreal by the time I was nine months old, I think. But I grew up with this idea, not you know how kids, you know, blend things in their brains. And my idea was that that this bad man called Hitler came to power in order to stop my father from doing Yiddish theater, <laughs> which now many years later seems like it wasn't that far from the truth. <laughs> But that's how I saw it, you know. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, he did uh, theater in the refugee camp. Uh, it was quite an, apparently an amazing place in the sense that uh, it had the highest birth rate in Europe. Those refugee camps had the highest birth rate in Europe per capita, and had a daily newspaper. It had a symphony orchestra, and it had not one but two uh, full-time Yiddish theaters, of which my father was one of the directors and actors. Um, yeah. And then as a kid, uh, when you guys had moved to Canada, I believe you were living in Montreal, is that right? Well, my father uh, and mother came over, they were sponsored by a relative and managed to, you didn't know where you were going to end up, you know, yeah. um, what country you were going to end up in, depending on where you could be sponsored by a relative and whether a country would accept you. And um, so my uh, my father and mother and me, my father was 20, my father and mother were like maybe the late 20s, and I was nine months old, and uh, he worked in a factory, and my mother we lived in a, you know, one room, without a bed, until there was, we were immigrants, you know, in a very working class, French-Canadian area, so my first languages were street languages, were street French, which is called Joao. Um, that's 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 <laughs> joal. That's kind no, of like a slang type. Of it's a ubonic. Yeah. It's a ubonic French. Uh, it's a working class French Canadian uh, patois, and uh, I had I had that in Yiddish. I know English, or very little English, uh, till I was about five or six, and um, and then we my dad got a job, a different kind of job, uh, in from from the factory, from the awful factory work, and he got a job in. Ottawa, we all moved to Ottawa right around the time I was halfway through first grade, and, and that's when, you know, if I didn't speak English, I was going to have the shit kicked out of me, so I had to learn English. And, and then I was bullied, and, uh, but I was a pretty tough kid because it was a pretty anti-Semitic neighborhood, 
as well as you know anti-French neighborhood. I mean, the Jewish immigrants hated the French Canadians yeah. as much as they hated them for no reason. It was just the way it was because they were immigrants and working class French Canadians, and the immigrants were coming in and taking their jobs. They thought, or whatever it was, you know, That's the goyim, the goyim on the one side is what they called them, and les juifs on the other side, les mozi juifs, the Christ killers, you know, on the other side. So, uh, so you had that world. So I was pretty tough. So by the time I mean I got into fights all the time when I was five years old, six years old on the street, and uh, rock throwing, punching. I mean, really rough. And I so I went to Ottawa. I, I couldn't be bullied for long. But also my you know my parents sent me to uh, acting classes every Saturday. By the time I was seven, um, and and uh, so I knew what I wanted to do right away. I mean it was like. No choice. That and you were working in local theaters. You were, what, you were a professional yeah. uh, child. No, 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 no. I wasn't professional at all. I was. Uh, it was the Ottawa Little Theater, which is one of the oldest uh, amateur theaters in Canada, and famously haunted, actually, but uh, quite old uh, from the uh, turn of the century or around the turn of the century. Um, and there were two. Um, I don't know how much detail you want to get into here, but there were two. There were two extraordinary women. Um, who were both RADA graduates, Royal Academy of Dramatic Arts graduates, who had followed their husband to the colonies. Their husband, one of them I remember was working for the British High Council in Canada, probably the Diplomatic Corps, I don't remember. But both of them, for some reason, found themselves in Ottawa. And one of them, Barbara Meikle John, and the other, Faith Ward, wonderful teachers and directors who taught children drama. Uh, and I was there, you know, and immediately fell into it feeling like a goldfish who had never f before found the water and I was in a bowl that I could swim in and I I always continually throughout my life um, you know looked for that bowl yeah so you really fell in love with theater and you knew that you wanted to be an actor uh, professionally when you were an adult did that cross your mind at all no no I I, I uh it wasn't uh, like that. Uh, I didn't uh, decide to become an actor professionally. I I just was an actor from the age of seven, and that's yeah. and that was that. And professional didn't mean anything to me. I mean, I wasn't making money at it. By the time I was old, I was nine or so, I started doing making money and doing CBC radio um, series and playing girls' parts, boys' parts, and stuff. And and then by the time I was, you know, we started our own companies. Uh, I've told some of these stories before, but um, the truth is that I became a professional by default um, in the sense that we paid ourselves. <laughs> what happened in, in Canada is unique to Canada, of course, and what happened uh, in the United States was the American, well, they were playwrights, of course, and all throughout history of in, uh, formation of, of the United States, but the, but the real voice of the American playwright as we know it today really began in Chicago and New York and in, the, in the teens and the 20s with Ben Hecht and Lee, who influenced, influenced O'Neill and, and, and but, but the, yeah. those playwrights then and, then and then the group theater and all the things that happened in the 30s. Kazan and... Uh, all of those voices that Carl created... Carmen. All those voices that created the American theater happened in those days. For whatever reason, it hadn't happened in Canada until I was, you know, 20. And there, were, there was a number of things that happened at once, both politically and socially and economically and creatively. And I'm not talking about French Canada, which had its own naissance, you know. Yeah. But our birth was, uh, uh, that, that birth of the Canadian playwright happened just as I, that birth of the Canadian playwright happened just as I, uh, was turning 21, 22. And I had already been at Stratford as a young member of the company and playing no roles whatsoever. And I left, uh, even though it was full-time employment, uh, in order to be with you know a group of people my age who were starting starting things. And so we formed our own theaters. They're all, they're all establishment theaters you know today. But for the most part, not always, we still did Chekhov and occasionally in Ibsen or or Shakespeare, or whatever, but we did mostly Canadian plays, and there was no such thing. I, I remember, you know, uh, 
the, the story that really stays with me is that about that is that I was um, I directed a film about 15 years ago for Showtime uh, and uh, and Paramount called um, Clubland. Oh, with Alan uh, Alda. Uh, Clubland is with Alan Alda and Stephen Weber and and Brad Garrett and and it was being produced for Dustin Hoffman's company. And Dustin Hoffman's company, the, the literary side of it, the dramaturgical side of it, um, Punch Productions was being run by Murray Shiskel, the playwright, Murray Shiskel. And I think he wrote Tootsie as well, right? Yeah. One of the writers on Tootsie, yeah. And um, working with Murray, I was directing it, it was written by Stephen Weber, but I said, you know, Murray, uh, you, in a way you changed my life. And he said, I changed your life. I said, yeah. When I was about 14 years old, my parents were visiting in New York, and I was visiting with them. And we went to see Love, L-U-V, Love, a play by you. And Love Changed Your Life, a play about middle-aged, you know, Eli Wallach and Ann Jackson and, Anna, and Alan Arkin. I said, it wasn't the play that changed my life. It was the intermission. And he said, uh, the intermission, how, how did that happen? And I said, well, when the play was good, but in the intermission, everybody in the lobby spoke exactly the same way as the people on stage. He said, yeah, it was a play about New Yorkers in, in that period. It was a modern dress, it was a present day. I said, yeah, but that was a, new to me. I'd never been in the theater, ever where the people in the lobby sounded like the people on the stage. Yeah. It had never, I'd never seen it. There was never really a play in Canada where it sort of simulated what the culture was that you would Not that I'd ever about. seen. Yeah. And it was rare. It was not rare in French Canada, but it was certainly rare in English Canada. Rare. And so seven years later, or eight years later, I was a part of that movement where you could hear people in the lobby sounding like the people that were on stage. What do you think uh, you learned early on about your craft as an actor working in theater that still kind of translates today when you're working, uh, even if you're you know working primarily in film? I don't know. Um, it's a really. It, it, I'm a fairly untrained uh, actor, except by experience, because my training was so young. Um, not that I didn't try to get into drama school; they just it would, none of them would have me for whatever reason. But. Um, it wasn't so much that I was looking for training as I was looking for a family, you know, a family of actors and people, yeah. a place to belong more than I was looking for training. But that didn't happen, and I don't know. I mean, it, it, it's a really um, personal question for every actor who does theater. I guess I have a prejudice that in every actor who can do stage can do film. But I don't think it's true the other way around. I don't think every any actor, every actor who can do film can do stage because, you know, the real trick is not getting to opening night. Any damn fool who's got talent can get to opening night, and guts. But doing it months on end, you know, doing eight shows a week yeah. is another muscle altogether, because any actor knows who does theater, is that the 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 best show in your first week, doesn't even come close in quality to your worst show in your last week. And because there's a wonderful word in French for the word audience, it's assistance. Your audience teaches you how to perform and, uh, and how to do your work on stage. And that's not what happens on film. Everything that you do on film is to give the director and the editor choices in that editing room. That's everything. That's all you're doing. Uh, is creating those choices for the people that are going to put it together. Yeah. And the technique of acting in film is your relationship between yourself and the director and the, and the scenario and your fellow actors in order to create whatever possible to put into that editing room. Did, but did it take you time to learn that initially when you started transitioning from theater into movies? Sure, but I got lucky because I had all, I spent 20 years on, almost 19 years, 20 years before I, on stage before I ever was in front of a camera in my mid to late twenties, twenty six or so, and uh, and within a year or so, or two, 
um, was a great French Canadian uh, film and television director called Claude Jutra, who was many people call the father of French Canadian cinema. And Claude came to Toronto from Quebec uh, to work at the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, where I was just starting to um, make a name for myself and get work, and the doors were just opening for those of us. You know, by my mid to late twenties, suddenly those doors started to open for a lot of reasons, and we were getting work in television. We couldn't do it before. Yeah. We had to couldn't get that that those jobs. But now it was opening up. The kind of programming was opening up to new directors and new new um, writers and actors. And Claude came and uh, found award winning shows in their you know in their rejection piles. But one of the shows that he did was. Um, uh, an hour-long thing that I was in with Mark, Martin Short, actually. Probably the first time Martin Short was ever on film. And one of the first times I was ever on film. It was a prison drama comedy called Sear Was Here. And uh, probably make a great feature, actually. But it was only an hour. And I played... And, and he cast me against the advice of CBC uh, executives who didn't want me in this role because it was a role of a of a biker who is in jail who has such a good time, or is he, is he just pretending, that they eventually let him loose because it, it, it's disrupting the entire jail system. Um, it was a very interesting concept. And when he said to me, they really liked me and I really liked him, we became very good friends, we did two or three projects together, maybe more. And he, in that first project, he said, uh, Come with me, and, and I'm going to make you an assistant to my assistant editor. He'll be a lowly assistant. And then, of course, it was film. It was Steenbeck's. It was cutting film with glue and scissors and razor blades. And, and I said, okay. And so I went into the editing room. I'd never been in an editing room. And I was playing the lead in this thing. And he taught me where... He said, look, for example, uh, this is where you fuck up a take for your fellow actor, not on purpose, but I can't use your best take in reverse because of this, this, this. And I began to understand that there was a technique that you either, you don't have to know it as an actor. A lot of great film actors have never been in an editing room would care less about that stuff. But my brain kind of operated that way, for better or for worse. And I... Uh, but especially coming from theater, where it is, you know, very you know, process oriented, you're rehearsing for weeks and months, so having that understanding of sort of how... Well, it certainly, certainly made a difference to me, yeah. for whatever the reason, I don't know whether my brain would have operated that way, whether I'd ever done theater, but, uh, but it's certainly, you may be right, it's, it's, it, it could have been for that reason, but I was fascinated by, by the technique, and I was fascinated by what happens in the editing room, and I began to realize it was all about that room, it was all about that room that it was very difficult to direct a film if you haven't edited a film. And, uh, and if you don't know how to edit, if you don't know what's going on in the editing room, how do you know where to put the camera? You know, you begin to understand what you need. And, uh, and as an actor, he was in a way he was training me to be a director, but he was really also training me to be a, <laughs> an actor. I mean, it's, it's, it's really interesting, you know, I don't know, to get into the minutia of stuff like this, but what the hell nobody else does, right, in interviews. Uh, I'll, I'll give you the minutiae. I'll give you an example. I have a pet peeve on, on movie sets, which is when you get a director, um, this will only relate to actors who are working actors who have been on television sets and movie sets with fairly inexperienced directors, and, or directors who just accept this out of hand or don't know about editing, is that they'll tell you not to overlap your fellow actors. I just tell you, yeah. Don't overlap. Sometimes the sound guy will even tell you, like, don't. Yeah. I've seen that too, where they're mm -hmm. like, you know, well, and the sound guy tells the director, and the director says, "Oh, sorry, we had an overlap there. We have to do it again." And the actors always go, "Sure," and I go, "So what? I'm mic'd. They're mic'd. What's the problem with the overlap? Why are we all stopping for an overlap?" Well, I mean, the ca I'm on camera. Yeah. Well, you're not actually on camera. It's over your shoulder. I said, "I know, but." Look, I, I've been in an editing room, and then they all roll their eyes. And I said, I'm, no, I'm going to... Uh, fuck it, man. Here's the point. I don't care about an overlap 
if there's no, which I'll never get work again. I don't want to work with Ruben Tech. <laughs> there's like, he's such a prima donna. But here's the thing. If you and I are talking, overlapping each other, yeah. it's an interview situation where we're not really doing that. But if it requires an argument, let's say we start to have an argument right now. And the fact that we're overlapping each other gives it energy. Many directors will say, yeah, don't worry about that. We'll create the overlaps in the editing room. I said, I don't know, but I'm an actor. I mean, we're giving you something here that you, you can't recreate properly in an editing room. And if he's mic'd and I'm mic'd, your only problem is if you're cutting in the middle of an overlap. Yeah. If you're cutting in the middle of an overlap, the worst that'll happen is there'll be a half a second of looping that you may have to do with the techniques that they've got now. It's not really a problem. But what you're saving on the one side is the energy in the scene. So, for example, I wouldn't have known that if I hadn't been in an editing room. And also, Claude taught me that unless it's a cut point, the truth is that, you know, if I pick up my glasses here and say, what do you think? But if I say, you know, um, you know, what do you think? And then you follow, and then in the middle of dialogue, I pick up my glasses where it's not a natural cut point. It's not as important about continuity. Continuity, I, I learned a lot about whether or not it's going to be one take or another. I learned not to waste my time thinking about things as an actor. That um, I, I learned to be a little bit more efficient uh, by being in an editing room as an actor, and not to and not to worry about things that are um, too technical, and just to stay in by knowing. Let me put it this way. By knowing technical things, I could forget about them and concentrate on what was important. Yeah, you don't have to worry about it up in the back. Whereas many actors who are on film for the first time are surrounded by mics and crew and lights, and, and it's intimidating, and you just want to do what you're told, and you, it's very easy to lose sight of the, of the fact that you're just supposed to be in the scene in the moment. Yeah. You know, Very tricky to do unless you trust everybody. And being in theater uh, is all about that. It's all about... Uh, you, you have you know a take that lasts 15, 20 minutes or a half hour or an hour or whatever. Yeah. It's like being in a long take and you've got to relate, you've got to hear the audience in a comedy especially. Your timing all depends on the audience. I don't know if I really answered your question about what, what, what theater did for me as a film actor and I, I don't even know if the, if, you know. What's I'm interesting is that, uh, you know, like you, you're started as a theater actor, you embrace movies. Um, I've met a lot of theater actors, uh, you know, whether college or, you know, over the years, they really sort of look down on movies as like, that's what I do for my, that's what I do for my income. And it's not really like their, their, uh, you know, their artistic expression. I don't know if you've, seen that philosophy kind of a... <laughs> or the other way around. I mean, yeah. well, nobody's going to go to theater to make money. But anybody who gets into this in any way... Look, uh, poverty likes to cloak itself in holiness, doesn't it? Yeah. So if you're poor, you're holy. So I don't make any money. I must have integrity. What a bunch of bullshit. And just because you're rich doesn't... <laughs> doesn't mean, you know, and just because you're rich doesn't mean you have integrity either. I mean, it's, a, it's, it's all crap. That's all crap. All that stuff's crap, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. uh, whether or not it's theater, film, or radio, or books, or I mean, we're just trying to communicate with some story to each other. And one one medium has more integrity than I don't know. I, I, I'm you know I'm doing um, I'm doing a five act play. And you're doing a web series. Let's get serious. My five act play. It's a five act play, and you're doing a web series. <laughs> and you go and you go fuck you. You know, how do you know? I mean, my web series could be the young Coppola, or or and uh, and your five act play could be some piece of shit from from you know the Renaissance that never made it, that never made it. Who the hell knows? Yeah. I mean, it's like I, I no, I I don't I don't subscribe to any of that. So the first time that uh, you made like a big feature film, I believe it was Agency, which starred uh, Robert Mitchum and uh, Lee Majors. So what was that like being around someone, the sort of the stature of Robert Mitchum, this huge movie star, and here you are, it's kind of your first uh, major motion picture? I had worked on 10 or so television shows that were uh, much higher quality than, a, than that movie by that time. Yeah. And I knew what I was doing. I was in a, I was in a movie that wasn't all that well written, and it was, it was okay. I had I had a, I had probably the best role in it, and uh, 
And in fact, when I and I wasn't intimidated by the fact that I was working with, uh, you know, with Robert Mitchum. Or in fact, I was pleased. I mean, I I went, but you know, it already been. I was twenty nine or so, and uh, I was thirty. You know, I'd been working for twenty three years as an actor, and I and I and although I had done, but I had done six or seven or eight leading roles and. In, in really good Canadian television. Canadian television was a much higher quality than Canadian features in the late 70s. Much higher. Much higher quality of work, but directors and writing and acting. So here was this movie that, you know, um, was on, uh, that was being made for a lot of money. Um, Canadian director, a really good director, George Katzender, and a great one of the great Canadian producers, Robert Lantos, was the second movie. Uh, Lantos was probably one of the most successful um, uh, Canadian producers um, over the last 50 years and um, but <laughs> meeting Robert Mitchum was uh, uh, Mr. Mitchum yeah he was working in a script I thought that was pretty cool what do you want? Oh, I'm, I, I just want to choose myself, so I'm going to be playing. Oh, you're, you're one of the actors. Nice to meet you. You're working on your script. I saw he was writing across the whole page, just N A R. I said, What is that? Uh, no acting required. N A R. No acting required. What are you playing? I said, I'm playing Goldstein. So, oh, well, that's the best fucking part in this whole fucking movie. That's the best part. If you're not the best thing in this movie, I'd quit the business if I were you. And I remember saying, oh, no, I, I will be the best thing in the movie. <laughs> <laughs> he liked that a lot, which I knew he wouldn't. And so that was my first meeting with Robert Mitchum. Yeah, and he was someone in movies who was always, you know, very natural. He never, you know, you never saw him sort of going, you know, over the top or, you know, he was very much like being, you know, Robert Mitchum, you know, but... Uh, no, well, that's a secret, isn't it? Yeah. Is that he, he, was, uh, he gave you the illusion that he wasn't doing anything. I was going to ask you about a really interesting film called uh, Bonfire of the Vanities, which uh, Brian De Palma directed. Uh, at the time, it was considered like this huge, you know, studio film. Bonfire of the Vanities was a best-selling novel by Tom Wolfe. Uh, I know Brian De Palma is, you know, very kind of meticulous about, you know, the shots he wants. You know, he has these very structured shot lists. Uh, so, what was it like working with him and uh, working on that movie? Um, it was uh, a really great book, brilliant book, and the role that I auditioned for was one of the four leads, but in the screenplay version, it was cut down. To Quite a bit. Yeah. But in the novel, he's kind of a primary character. Primary character, yeah. yeah. So I didn't know which way it was going to go, and um, I, I got an audition with him, and uh, I, uh, I wanted the role. I really wanted the role. And uh, I'd never met him. And the great casting director, Lynn Stallmaster, was casting this movie. And I knew the competition would be stiff. And uh, I got into this room, it was at 1 Fifth Avenue. He had an office right off Fifth Avenue. And, uh, and, brought, and, and Fifth Ave, right at Fifth Avenue, what street? I don't know. I got into, the, into his office and he was looking at a computer. It was 1989, I think, or 90, 89, something like that. And uh, he was, wasn't it? Something like that. I think mean, he came out in 90, so it was probably... Yeah, 90 or something like that. So he was at a computer. I didn't look up when I came in. That was not good. I didn't look up. Not good. <laughs> not good, right? <laughs> I thought, oh, God, what the hell am I going to do now? He's going to look up eventually, but he's not interested in me. And I said, so, you know... Uh, Brian, that the rumor on the street is 
that if you make the king laugh, you get the hand of his daughter. He looked up. Mm. Huh? What? I said, yeah, that's the rumor on the street. And he started to laugh. <laughs> and, uh, and the hand of the daughter being the role, I said, only you can say, but I made you laugh. And, uh, mm -hmm. and then I said, uh, he started to look at me kind of a little interested, which is what I was hoping to happen, because you have to do something, Jesus. Because he was so dour, I remember. And uh, <laughs> I looked, he looked depressed. I didn't know what was going on with him, but I didn't know I had to do something. And I had prepared something that was unusual, I knew I had. And I, I started to talk to him about the character. And he started listening to me. And, and it took him about, I was talking like, like I am now, like straight talk, but with that interruption for about, let me see, I'm going to be fair about how long I was talking. Two minutes? Two full minutes? Yeah. And then he realized I was doing the book. I had memorized, I had a, we have a really good memory. I still do. I had memorized 20 pages of the book. Mm. Wow. I mean, just knew it. And I could do it just conversationally. And he just sat back and listened to me do this character and talk about this character, like Thomas Wolfe, but mostly it had to do with the character. I think first person, as I recall, but I don't remember exactly. But I knew it was impressive, not just the memory, but what I was doing, and yeah. it was getting his attention. He wasn't looking at his computer. And, uh, and then he said, do you know it? Okay, that was impressive. Do you know any scenes? I said, any scene in, in the screenplay? You don't need a script, I said, no, I don't need a script. And uh, he said, okay, and proceeded to do every scene, I mean, just about every scene he really wanted to test me, and I, and I knew it. But I also knew the character. And then when I got out, Lynn Stallmaster said, I've never seen an audition like that, I've been casting director for a long time. I've never seen an audition like that. Uh, I mean, then I had to wait while every other actor auditioned, and then I got the role. Yeah. But I know you, I beat up. You in the work, you, you read the book, you, I mean, some actors just read the screenplay and face value and... I don't know. I mean, I know there were good actors up against it and I, there's something happened between me and him though. And then we got along really well. I really admired him and I loved the way he shot. And Vilma Sigmund was the cinematographer, one of the great artists of the century and both them together were interesting. I, you know, the, the problem was that the tone of the script was a little arch and the critics excoriated it and you know it was as if genocide had been committed or something you know I guess some people thought it was uh, it was very different from the tone of the novel which was I guess uh, fine darker but uh, <laughs> fine whatever I mean I had a great time doing it I learned a lot I had a great time Tom Hanks was a real gentleman and a prince and that's where I, my first of uh, uh, of twice working with uh, Morgan Freeman because I uh, I work with Morgan again in Unforgiven a few years later and uh, just wonderful actors, you know, and, and a great time. It was, yeah. uh, it was uh, a really special uh, experience for me. Um, I had a really good time on that. Um, I remember that really, really clearly because he's such a, he's such a shot maker and such an interesting mind, uh, De Palma. You know, such a man, such born to be in, in, in film. And, loves it so much and uh, it was a, it was a, it was a real privilege you know, to be on the set even though the movie wasn't successful you know that, yeah. that could go either way who the fuck knows why something's successful I think every one of Brian De Palma's movies you know looks brilliant he has such a he's such an eye for, yeah. for shots and composition. well that one is I think uh, unfairly disregarded it's got some brilliant shooting in there yeah, so the first shot of the movie is like a steady cam through with Bruce Willis as he's kind of kind of a similar kind of shot to that. what um, uh, to what Scorsese used a few years before that oh, in, Goodfellas. in Raging yeah. Bull and in Goodfellas. Oh, yeah. Well, Raging Bull coming right into the ring, and a Goodfellas going into the table into the nightclub. Yeah. Right, but uh, really long 
shot. It was it was a shot that started in a golf cart, then ended up on a steady cam, and then ended up, you know, however it ended up. It was really, really fascinating. And all film, of course, so you only had so many minutes, you know, where yeah. it's not digital, where you can keep the shot going. So you had just kind of nine, ten minutes to get in there? Uh, so I was going to ask you about Unforgiven, which is you know, probably one of the greatest westerns ever made and ended up winning an Oscar for Best Picture. Uh, and your role in that was really interesting because you were the author of a book that was being written about uh, Richard Harris's character and you were following him along and you're really you know, reacting and listening to all of this crazy behavior that's happening around you where you know, Gene Hackman is kind of attacking Richard Harris and you're you know, witnessing the, you know, the climax of the film, this huge shootout in the saloon. Uh, so how did you sort of approach that character when you read the script? Um, it, was, it was really uh, an amazing script. I was working with uh, Jack Nicholson on a movie called Man Trouble. And uh, Jack Nicholson said, I hear by the grapevine that you're going to be auditioning for my old pal Clint Eastwood. And I said, how'd you hear that? He said, I hear gossip. You know, and I said, uh, let me give you a little advice. And I said, okay, when's the last time you auditioned for anything, Jack? And he <laughs> said, oh, you think I'm an asshole? I said, no, 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 I just think that I could tell you a little bit about auditioning and you could tell me how to be a movie star, but I think, you know, as far as advice is going, well, no, I'll, I was just fucking around, but I said, I'll take any advice that you give me. He said, uh, just do more than's required. We do more than's required. You're going to put yourself on tape, I heard. I said, yeah, you're going to go into that casting office and put yourself on tape. I said, no, I don't want to do that. He said, don't do that. Make your own tape, which is now common, but in those days, in, in 91 or 90 or whatever it was, 91, it wasn't common. And um, I said, I'm going to do it to my, myself. Yeah, do that, do that. So I put myself on tape, lit it properly, did more than they asked me to do, did other scenes that weren't required, and some people hate that. But I got cast right away. Mm. And uh, I asked him, when I met him, I got brought out to do a costume fitting and a boot fitting. The boots were all made for us. I still have those boots. And, um, and I met him for the first time. And I said, why did I get cast? He said, your tape stood out. I told him the Jack Nicholson story. He said, he was right, he was right. And uh, I said, uh, let me ask you something. You're an actor. Why don't you, why? You weren't seeing any actors. No actors. Everybody said, no, no, you can't. I wanted to see you in person. Yeah. He said, no, he doesn't see anybody in person. I said, Clint, what? Why don't you see anybody? He said, oh, I, I, I wouldn't be able to say no <laughs> to anybody I meet. You know, I just. Yeah, I've read that, like, even today, he just sees people on tape, and the first time that he meets an actor is kind of the first day they're on the set. And so, he goes into... so when we were on the set, um, I remember saying to him, uh, listen, I've got this idea, can I talk to you about? Sure. I said, you know, uh, it's a great script and everything, but my character, W.W., doesn't talk for the first little while. I'm not, I don't want lines, but he, he doesn't say anything. But his attitude that's written there is very nervous and fearful, and he's coming to the West for the first time. And, and then eventually, you know, he comes out on the sidewalk with, with English Bob and, and he's surrounded by deputies and guns and he pees his pants. And that's when they ask him, what do you do? I'm a writer, you know. Letters and such? No, 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 I write, you know. And uh, I said, I think it's wrong. He said, well, what's wrong? I don't think my attitude should be nervous. I think I should be full of myself. I think I should be smug and I think I should feel like I know exactly where I'm going. And then, and then when I'm, you know, it'll be a kind of a nice surprise, <laughs> you know. And he said, and you're telling me this because, why are you telling me this? I said, because you're the director of the movie and I'm changing what's in the script. Mm -hmm. He said, okay, so I'll, you'll get to know me and you'll find out that, first of all, you're, you're, um, you're in charge of the department of W.W. W. Beauchamp. That's your department, not mine. You're in charge of the character. Not me. You don't need to tell me everything that you want to do, unless you're changing dialogue, but I'm not, not changing dialogue. 
anything you want to do with this, just do it. And yeah. I'll be sure to ask you if I don't understand something. And he was true to his word. And I'll, I'll tell you that uh, I have never seen actors direct, directed less than I have on Unforgiven. Uh, he would say, I, you know, it's up to you, but if you want to be lit, I would move a little bit to your left. You know? <laughs> you know. So that's what's interesting about Clint Eastwood is that, um, you know, especially compared to other directors who are more kind of in your face, he casts the right people that he believes He's in. He's lucky. And then he lets them kind of interpret the script and do their job. And by doing that and not, be, not being so micromanaging, it allows, you know, interesting moments to happen. And not just the actors. Everyone. Yeah. Uh, everyone. The whole crew. You know, I mean, he, uh, he had, uh, my interpretation of him directing was that many directors that I've worked with have a, a, a t-shirt on and the t-shirt says on the front, my vision, and on the back it says, shall be realized. And he, if Clint had a t-shirt on, it would say, my vision, on the front. And on the back, it would say, hopefully, will be transcended. And that's the essence of collaboration. Don't forget, this is a guy whose heart is really as a jazz musician, right? He's an improviser and a jazz musician. That's where he is. That's where, that's really kind of what he loves, and along with movie making and acting. But he's, he was a jazz pianist. Yeah. And uh, so that element of who he is is in his work. Um, Kind of like the way Bob Dylan likes to record rough stuff, you know? He likes to record it rough. And he likes that kind of reality to happen. He never even says action. Because he hates the fact that, as an actor, he hated that stress. And he doesn't want to give it to anybody else. So he says, all right, go ahead, anytime you feel like you want to start. Yeah. He'll say that works. instead you of see action. The, you see the performances in all of his movies, even Mystic River and, you know everything that's been uh, yeah it's not the know. only way to direct and and uh, it's just his way to direct and I'll say I'll say this it, it works most of the time but don't forget that when we did Unforgiven maybe people forgotten this he had had five financial not critical but five financial failures in a row I don't remember what the movies are whether they're Pink Cadillac and and Tightrope and uh, uh, or um, I don't remember White Hunter Black Heart uh, um, there were a number of them uh, yeah. Bird. There were a number of them that were really interesting films that hadn't made money or much money. And so this was a bigger movie, and he had more people above the line, bigger stars than he normally did. Usually just him and one other name, but this was a number of names. So he didn't direct actors, and he, he, he let it all loose, you know. Um, uh, he liked the feeling that things were happening. Uh, I'll tell you, you know, if you were even knowledgeable about film, and you went on the Unforgiven set, and Clint was not a, let's say he wasn't a famous face, as he is, and you knew a lot about what movie sets were like, it would take you 15, 20 minutes to figure out who the director was on that set. Yeah. You couldn't, he was not standing around giving orders. He wasn't like an authority figure, people didn't see, well, well the director He was, but he just, high. he was an authority figure, but a very quiet, unassuming yeah. uh, one a very gentle authority figure, and he had sat with that script for almost a decade before he decided he was right for it, you know. It's an amazing, that's a very unusual film. I, I, I met David Peoples uh, years later, a few years later after doing it, not that many, about three years later, I was shooting a movie in San Francisco and David Peoples, the author, was working or living in Berkeley, and I, I, I met him for the first time and I said, what was this like? And he said, can you imagine? I mean, I wrote this script in the 70s, 78, and then Francis Ford Coppola bought it. There were a few pages that were changed. It was supposed to be a zoetrope, first film, first Western by Coppola, but it, it ended up getting sent as a writing sample to Clint, who bought it from Coppola and sat on it for a decade. Mm -hmm. And then I wasn't on the set, and then one day I get a call from Clint saying, do you want to come to a screening of the movie? And I said, wow. And so then David went to L.A. and went to, I guess went to Mount Paso and they had a screening room and they, he saw the movie. Mm -hmm. I, he said, I was expected to be in an audience. I said, you weren't? He said, it was me and Clint and the movie. And I said, what happened? He said, I wept, man. 
I said, why? He said, because it's not a word was changed. You got to, I mean, I, I saw what I wrote in 78. He said, you've got to understand that as writers, we basically sell our children. They're brought up by other people so that we can eat. You sell your children off one by one. I think that's always them. been a Clint Eastwood's philosophy. When he commits to a script, he commits to that draft of the script. He doesn't go in and make drastic changes. He's very like, you know, this is what I believe in. That's why I'm committing to, to the script. Yeah, well, yeah. certainly was in this case. And I just can't get over how David Peoples must have felt yeah. watching that uh, when you never see that. I mean, scripts are rainbow colors by the time you end them. Because every time there's a change in a line in a movie script, it's a different colored paper with a different date on it. So you have a script that looks like a rainbow by the time you're done. But that script was all white pages when we were done. It was all white pages. Not a word had been changed in that script. Not a word. I must say about uh, your performance in the, you know, the last scene in the movie when you're in that saloon, you look absolutely terrified. I mean, I don't know how you... Uh how that, where that came from, but I mean, it's incredible the way you're was, so concentrated and in the moment of the chaos that's happening. I don't remember, I don't remember any of that. I do remember <laughs> this. Here's what I remember out of, of that scene. I remember this. Hey, Clint, do you never work with video assist? He said, not unless there's stunts, you know. Really? I mean, you're directing and you're acting in it. And he goes, hey, man, I've only got two performances. I've got brim down, brim up. I said, funny, man. And that was a funny line. And, uh, okay, so we're doing the scene. Just the two, two of us, everybody else is dead. And there were only two of us left. And he does his close-up. And uh, he's famous for, he, what he does is he does two takes and then moves on. Otherwise it's jerking off, you know. I mean, two good takes. Not just two takes, just two good. Once he gets two good takes, he'll move on. At least that's what he, how he operated in Unforgiven. Yeah. And I heard from other actors that was cool. So he did two good takes. And then I, and I was nervous because I, I said, hey, Clint. He said, what? I said, ask the director for another take. Oh. I said, he said, you think I can do it better? I said, yeah. <laughs> Okay, but if I use that third take and it is better, I'm not giving you any credit for it. I said, okay, it's fine. So I was nervous because I said that. But I did say it. And he did, and the take that's in there is the third take, as I recall. But I remember saying, I think you could do another take. Yeah. It was a big thing to say. <laughs> I remember. It's a great performance. And nobody had really seen the Tarantino movie, right? At that point, Reservoir Dogs was not out yet. And, uh, I didn't know what to think. But I got talked into it. It was being cast by uh, Risa Brayman, who I knew, and her partner at the time, Billy Hopkins, who was in L.A. And Risa, I think, was in New York at the time, and I didn't know Billy, but he was casting it, and I got an audition to play as producer. And, um, okay, so I went in to audition, and I didn't know Tony Scott. I didn't know what he was like, or what his sense of humor was, or anything. And I'm doing this scene, and he goes, he's going to stop you for a, I want to stop you for just a second. It's great. It's great. You're doing it. You're doing Joel to a T. You got him down. I got to say, you got him down. But um, just can I, uh, can I just interrupt? I said, Joel, who's Joel? I don't know who Joel is. The character's name was Lee. He goes, oh, fuck, right. I, I'm talking about Joel Silver, the producer. I just wrote with him in Last Boy Scout. And you're doing him. I mean, that's who it's written about. And you're doing him. I said, uh, I just got a couple of things you could do a little bit. Can I give you a couple of pointers? And I said, yeah. yeah. And he started giving me these things from this guy that he knew who was a producer. And I stopped him and I said, listen, man, I, got, I mean, I got to tell you the, the horrible truth is that I'm really actually doing me. I mean, as horrible as this <laughs> that sounds, I'm not doing Joel, whoever he is. I've never heard of Joel. What, Silver? I don't know who that is. And I, I, I'm I, doing me. So you now are telling me to be, you with a Cockney accent, are telling me to do, are, are imitating somebody that I don't know and asking me third hand to do an imitation of that imitation. And I think you need somebody from Second City. 
I don't think you want me. I don't know how to do that. And uh, I mean serious. And he went, he turned to Billy Hopkins, and I didn't know he was kidding. I thought he was serious. He turned to Billy Hopkins. I mean, he was serious about what he was directing, but this line he said to Billy Hopkins was, I thought you said he wanted that pot. I thought you said he wanted that pot. And I got, I saw red, man. I just said, hey, Tony, not at any fucking price, I don't. Okay? And I got up and started to walk out. He said, well, that's him, that's the character. That says, cancel the other auditions, that's it. <laughs> you got it? And I went, what? And he cast me based on me telling him to go fuck himself. <laughs> and it worked. That was a great uh, performance in that. Uh... I mean, talk about an audition. Of I, I didn't know what had hit me. Yeah. I kind of walked out of that room and kind of floated for a little while, and I realized I'd been cast. Yeah. You know? uh, now I was going to hit on uh, Frasier, which uh, you had a great arc on. You played uh, Daphne's fiance. I think you were on maybe 15, 16 episodes, or even more than that. Uh, so, what was that like working on Frasier? Probably one of the greatest uh, sitcoms ever made. I, uh, I really was a fan of the show, and then one day I got a call saying one of the writers of Frasier wants to meet you. I think they're interested in you to do three episodes arc. I said to audition. He said, No, I think. I think that they've all seen your work and they're, they're kind of interested in casting you. I said, wow. So I remember going to meet the, uh, one of the writers and talking to him and then I was so, I was knocked out. I mean, okay, uh, they're just casting me. Okay, that's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. And uh, then I realized how really good casting I was because they all her boyfriends had been hunks, you know, these tall, gorgeous guys that Niles could never take seriously. And suddenly if they cast me and she's into it, that's gonna be a more serious thing. Yeah. And uh, I realized, I kept telling her to, she wanted to wear flats and I asked Jane Leaves who's, to put, leave her high heels on. I liked that difference between us, you know, I liked her to be taller and it was all really cool. What was really fun about it was that it was a, a very uh, close community of, of people in a hit show, which means that there was no network or studio interference. It was just network and studio congratulations and happiness. And it was like doing a little one-act play. Other shows that were on at the same time as that was on when I was working, like Friends or Seinfeld, were um, worked much longer hours than we did. Yeah. Uh, I remember there was really short hours, really short hours, astoundingly short hours. And nobody knew their lines. I mean, they kept trying to get trip me up. Yeah. Uh, people in the makeup room, right before we did a taping, that's when we did a line run through, and everybody was, you know, pretty good, but not that great. And if Kel if Kelsey caught you rehearsing a scene with another actor somewhere off in a corner, he would stop you. He would try to stop you, try to convince you that you shouldn't do it, because he wanted the spontaneity. He would be the first person to blow a line. He probably did it on purpose most of the time, just to loosen everybody up you know, in front of an audience. And, and of course, they were written differently than, you know, Friends or, or, or um, Seinfeld, other two great other series, but completely different style. Yeah. Frasier was really written as a one-act play, as a 22-minute one-act play. And it was uh, almost never did you, I don't remember ever going off to shoot a location, yeah. you know, a little bit. It was bit. very much on those sets. It was all on the yeah. set and fast, fast, man. It was, you were out of there. Your rehearsals were fast. And the other thing that was unusual about uh, Frasier, and I don't know about other uh, sitcoms and how they operated, but I knew a little bit about how they operated, because having been on others, is that in this case the actors' opinions were sought. I remember uh, the very first time I was there, after the read-through, whenever we started blocking, which was either that day or the next day, um, we'd block, and then once we'd block near the end of the day, the writers, all ten of them or however many there were, maybe more, would come and watch what we had done. Yeah. And then we, they'd watch it and then they would start to, you know, have a meeting about the writing, because you always got a better script that night later on when the writers, you always, they threw out the jokes that were just jokes and everything, anything that wasn't, um, you know, uh, in the skin of the characters was thrown out. They, they threw enough jokes to, for three other series. They just made sure it was really character-driven and not just jokey. So 
you've got a new script every night, which is not unusual for sitcoms, but they were talking to the cast, and I, the rest of the people, I moved away, me and the guest cast, and I remember Kelsey going, well, where, where do you think you're going? And I said, we were having a discussion with the writers. He said, well, I don't know how other sitcoms work, but you're an actor in this scene, and your opinion is as valuable as mine. And, uh, and so the actors were invited to, to talk to the writers about what was working for them and what wasn't. And I appreciated that. It's unusual collaboration. And it was part of the reason that show was a hit was the combination of that kind of generosity and collaboration, which I imagine, you know, uh, is rare. Yeah. Uh, it's kind of interesting, uh, you know, sort of how you, you transitions into directing films. Uh, Jerry and Tom which was uh, an interesting film where you opened with sort of this long, long take, the uh, Sam Rockwell and Joe Montana. Uh, so what was sort of that like developing that film initially? I had directed it as a one-act play. It's written by Rick Cleveland, who has uh, become a great uh, television writer. And, um, but at that point, he was a playwright only. He's still a playwright, too. But uh, Rick, it was a one-act play festival done at the Met Theatre in 1994, uh, modeled on the EST um, one-act play festival marathons that were done in New York. It's a theater in New York that does one-act play marathons. Yeah. And uh, it, I was asked to direct this one play by this playwright. It was a three-character play called Tom and Jerry, and I loved it. It was very, very funny. And it was a big hit of that little festival, one act plays. And it was a big hit of that little festival that we did in 94. And then I was looking to direct my first film. My wife and partner, Eleanor Reed, was, um, said, what about Jerry and Tom? What about Tom and Jerry is what it was called. And we approached Rick, and over a year we developed it into a screenplay. And, uh, and it was, so we had lived with it for a year or more before that wasn't that long and then we found the right financing through this little company called Cinepix, a Canadian company uh, who was about to change their name to Lionsgate. Uh. <laughs> uh, it was, uh, I had always had a theory and, uh, about actors in two shots. I mean, I was really upset quite often doing movies, working with a fellow actor on, on a scene in a two shot and then we're seeing it cut to shit in the editing room later. And the energy that we had in the two shot was magical. You just yeah. leave the camera alone, the actors are, you don't need to cut, 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 cut. And I hated it uh, quite often, it was really bad. And I knew I had a movie here that could be a series of two shots, that most of it could be done in a two shot, and that I didn't really need to cut much if I had two great actors. So I made sure I had two great actors. Although Sam Rockwell was unknown, at the time, but I had a feeling. Mm -hmm. And uh, and Joe Mantegna, obviously, and then I had Charlie Durning and Maury Chaikin and Peter Riegert and William H. Macy and Ted Danson. I had this amazing group of actors. And so I didn't really n need to do that much directing. And my plan was to keep it in single shots as much as possible, as much as possible, yeah. and let the actors do the work and, and give it a theatricality. And the transitions, there was time transitions that I did in the film that I planned with my cinematographer, Paul Sarasi, who's a great cinematographer, uh, and uh, my production designer, David Hackle, who's become a film director, but the two of them together collaborated brilliantly to help create transition shots that are all in the camera. They're all theatrical, there's no digital effects, but it looks like all the transitions are digital because they're, you go from interior night, winter, to exterior yeah, summer sun seamlessly yeah. without any cutting. And that's all theater, it's not digital. It's all theater, it's all done in camera. You know, it was really fun to do and it gives it a kind of a, an odd, it, could, it was very risky, it gave it an odd yeah. patina. It kind of pulls you in as a viewer, especially that opening uh, shot in the film where you're in the bar and it, you, know, you move around. I think it does, yeah. I think it, it keeps the tension going because you don't know whether he's gonna blow this guy's head off or not. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and, and I liked it, I liked it for that reason. And, I, and it was, it's very cinematic in its own way. Um, so that was an amazing experience uh, doing that film. And we got to you know, be in competition at Sundance, 
it was exciting, you know, and it launched uh, Rick's career as a screenwriter. Yeah. Worked on The West Wing, I think House of Cards, and uh... Nurse Jackie, yeah. uh, Six Feet Under for a number of years, and for the whole series. And yeah, he's one of the great television, one of the great screenwriters. He's, he's really a, a remarkable talent, and uh, um, and that was an amazing experience that. Uh, we were very lucky to be able to get financed. Today, it would be much harder to get that financed. It was done for around two and a half million dollars or so, but to get two and a half million dollars to do that today is very difficult, even with that those names. Yeah. Independent film doesn't really exist in the same way that. Uh, well, it does only digitally, I guess, on, yeah. on the web, and you can. It's, it, there are great indie films out there, but um, of course, and they're not all very low budget. But there's, but there, it's rare because. From the mainly because the um, the smaller mini studios that used to develop and, and distribute them are gone. Yeah. What do you think has been uh, the proudest moment of your career, or the project that you feel that you're the most proud of that you really uh, stands up above? Well, everything? this is going to sound really hokey, though. But it's honestly what I'm most proud of, and no one's very few people have seen it. Uh, my son Sam came to me in 12th grade and I was uh, working on Warehouse 13 uh, doing the, the fourth season of Warehouse 13 and so I was okay financially and I was doing well and loved doing that series and Sam said listen I've gotten together with two of my friends and two other guys and we, three other guys we really want to do Pinterest the birthday party and I went uh huh and you want me to direct it, you know, kind of. And uh, I thought about it, and I, I knew I was going to have to turn down other work uh, to do it. But I thought, you know, I, give, you know, give it to 80 man, 80 year old man on a bench test, which is a, a way that I make decisions sometimes. Which is, I put myself at 80, I'm going to have to change that to 90. Mm -hmm. um, and I put myself on a bench as an old man say. Sure, glad I took those other jobs and didn't direct my son in the Pinter play, and see how that feels. So that's so how I make decisions, and I um, I directed the play, and in order to do it, I said, "Look, uh, we have to do this in British accents. Uh, you can't do Pinter; it's written a certain way." And I'll hire a dialect coach for you guys, and we have to hire two uh, girls to play the two female roles, and. You've already cast the guys, you know, your friends in, in school. And I knew I'd have to direct it from January to April, because yeah. it's high school. And I wanted a commitment, and I said, there's two, reasons, two, two ways I'll do it. One, we do it with British accents, and you agree to use a dialect coach. And two, you have a spring break, and then you have a week, and then it opens, according to your schedule. He said, yeah. I said, I need you for your spring break eight hours a day, five days a week. Big commitment. <laughs> Eight hours a day, five days a week, during spring break. That's for two weeks. Or no. So I got them to commit. Once I got them to commit, I committed. And then we had a room, really not, you know, we could fit, I don't know how many people in there, 60 or 70 people. It was a room, it was like a, not a theater. And we created a room for that play. It's a very claustrophobic, dangerous, funny, dangerous play. And uh, it was great. It was great. And it was, it's over and you can't see it, you know. I mean, even though there's a DVD of it we made somewhere, but it's not the experience of the play. And, and uh, I was really proud of Sam and, and the cast and what we'd all created together over those months. And um, I'm really proud of that, that, uh, that that decision got made. I can tell you they got a lot out of it, but I can tell you this, I got more out of it than they did in a way, you know. And uh, that was an amazing experience for me. I learned a tremendous amount. Um, there are so many things that, that I've done that uh, I've been a part of that I'm proud of. There are a lot of things that, I mean, in the professional world, of course, I'm proud of. I was really proud of the fact that I'd written a play that got on, was on in London at the Chocolate Factory in 2011, and then it got translated into German, and it was on in Berlin, um, in this beautiful theater, 
in the, in the country that I was born in. It was very strange because when I was 20 years old, maybe two blocks away from that theater on the Kafirst and Dam, I was playing guitar as a street musician for money. And 40 years later, I'm 40 oddly, or 45 years later, my play is on. It's called Terrible Advice. And I'm really, that, that was a really big moment for me because it was created, um, you know, using techniques that, improvisational techniques that I had learned years and years before as a young actor, and it had had a long, many 20 year journey. So it was a big thing, you know. Um, I've just uh, written a pilot uh, based on the play that we're trying to find a home for. So that was a, that was a, a very proud thing, you know, to, yeah. to have spent a long time and actually get it in front of an audience. Um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm uh, some of the things that I, that you've never heard of, you know, I mean, movies like The Quarrel, uh, little, little films that I'm, that I'm really glad I did, that meant a lot to me. Um, the documentary film that I made about my parents that I produced, uh, bringing them back to Poland to have that reunion, So Many Miracles, is a huge part of my life and, and my children's lives, of course. Um, mm -hmm. I've also taught classes using the book and the documentary, not so much about Holocaust education, but as a way to inspire children to, well, teenagers, uh, to uh, learn their own family histories and do, do creative work with that, to find out uh, whether, whether they can tell other people their own family histories and uh, encouraging them to do the research and find out what's, what's, what's in their recent and, and um, in background and even, you know, even not so recent because um, it's filled with drama and high stakes, even if they think it's not. If you go, if you research your own background, you'll find, like all of human history, it's filled with your own family with miraculous escapes at the last minute, great love affairs, betrayal, hatred, murder, suicide, all of it. It's all there. Everything that you've ever read in any great novel is in, within the last 50 years of your own family. It's there, um, if you if you've got the courage to explore it, and if you've got the persistence to make something out of it that you want to share with other people, then what you get back is way 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 more than you give. Um, so that's a huge part of my life. Um, I'm a dad, you know, and uh, my daughter's an actress and a writer. She's 23. My son's in second year of college. She's an actor and a writer and a director and a musician and I'm I'm been married um, tomorrow 24 years. Wow. Congratulations. Um, thank you. <laughs> to so I'm incredibly fortunate I feel to have been doing something all my life that I love. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>